Well, thank you, Rick, and thank you to Principal Solar for inviting me back uh, to provide an update as to what Gravity Power has been doing. We're excited about the progress that we're making, and I'm delighted to have an opportunity to share that with what has at least in the past been a large group of people, and I hope in the future will be. Some of the things that uh, that have changed since October 2011 uh, in that presentation include the fact that uh, last year we had a couple of patents issued, one in the U.S. and one in, in uh, South Africa, uh, and we've received feedback uh, from Mexico, Russia, and China that uh, we're in the final stages of that patent work. So uh, we're making good, strong progress there. We're also progressing with the IP filed in, and patents filed in all of the major world markets. So the IP progress has been significant and continues to, those, those gears continue to turn it. We've actually been in that process going back into 2008 uh, with serious patents filed in 2009. So takes a long while to to get that to mature. Uh, one of the fundamental changes in what we've done has been moving to a single piston design, and I'll go through that more in the presentation. And our plan still is to sell turnkey plants working with established EPC firms and established pump turbine motor generator suppliers like Andritz, Foyt, and Alstom. Andritz has been very helpful providing technical information and price estimates for their equipment as we've gone through the process. So if we look at the, uh, the LCOEs or the levelized cost of energy for the competition, the first uh, thing I think about is gas turbines. And this uh, chart shows you how the gravity power module, um, it's shown in green in these in these bar charts, compares to uh, gas turbines, simple cycle, and on the far right, uh, combined cycle. Now the assumptions behind this model are that we can purchase off-peak power at uh, forty dollars a megawatt hour, and natural gas uh, for expensive uh, gas projects cost $15 per million BTU, and for cheap gas projects, uh, $350. Now, the $350 was assumed to be the U.S. More recently, that's climbing up to $4 per million BTU, and the $15 per million BTU is more like Germany. So if you look at this chart, you see that the small gas, uh, the small GPM peaker, uh, competes well with the expensive gas, simple cycle gas turbine, the two bars on the left. Uh, although it's a little bit more expensive, it provides a number of other advantages. And when you get to the large peaker, uh, the, small, the small GPM peaker is 40 megawatts for four hours. The large GPM peaker is 1,600 megawatts for four hours. You get to the large GPM peaker, and you're down to $76 per megawatt hour or 7.6 cents per kilowatt hour on a levelized cost of energy basis. And that starts looking very attractive. You can see that even in the U.S. with cheap gas, the levelized cost of energy for four hours of operation a day uh, from a GPM is less than the simple cycle gas turbine. And then further over on the right, you see that if you're running 10 hours a day, uh, the GPM, large turbine or large system, gets down to 6.7 cents a kilowatt hour, or $67 per megawatt hour. So that then starts looking like it beats combined cycle gas turbines for that intermediate duty uh, generation in Europe, uh, although with cheap gas in the U.S., the gas turbine combined cycle still looks good for that kind of operation, but that's based on 24-hour-a-day operation, which is why that $29 uh, per megawatt hour figure exists.
So then if we look at the energy storage market, and I mean, when you're thinking about backing up wind and solar and the changing uh, generation mix of the grid, you've got the gas turbines, which have done it historically, but uh, certainly there's been a lot of discussion of energy storage taking over a portion of that backup. And historically, uh, that has been accomplished with uh, pumped hydro and uh, this is actually a chart that compares all of the different storage technologies developed by EPRI uh, back in December 2010, and the red marks on this chart I have added. So, but if we talk a little bit about the market uh, for energy storage before we get into the details of the chart, one of the things that we found recently is there's a forecast uh, for 2020 that would say that 56 billion euros will be spent uh, on energy storage plants. And, and it, you know, forecasts are forecasts, but it's clear that tens of billion dollars of year, uh, per year will be spent in the coming years uh, uh, for energy storage. Uh, one One interesting statistic is that China's installed some classical pump storage hydro, uh, completing nine projects between 1997 and 2011. Those projects range in size from 800 megawatts to 2,400 megawatts, and total 11,600 megawatts. So you can see that classical pump storage hydro is being installed, and you can also see that at least in China, the size of projects is, is large. Uh, so if we go back to the thinking about the chart here, uh, and you remember from the prior slide on, on the GPM cost, we have that 7.6 cents per kilowatt hour, and in the lower left by the circle, you see I've added an arrow, which shows that on the EPRI comparison, we're, we're less costly on a levelized cost of energy basis than classical pump storage hydro, uh, compressed air energy storage case, or any of the batteries uh, and including the gas turbines over on the right. So that makes this a very appealing technology to, that deserves strong consideration. One of the things that I'd point out is if you look at the, the case, which is in the red circle because we think of pump storage uh, classical pump storage hydro and K's as being the two things that uh, can provide utility scale storage. For some of the U.S. projects like Seneca, the K's uh, cost came in four times higher than is shown on this chart. So some of the EPRI data is pretty aggressively low as shown. And Siting has been a real problem for the compressed air energy storage. Uh, the Seneca project was canceled to, because of salt cavern issues. And those of you who followed that, that uh, technology know that the Iowa project was canceled because of aquifer issues. So there has been uh, some attempts to move forward with it, but they, they have been a troubled technology. So if we look at how the gravity power module works, uh, you can see that we have um, a pump turbine in the upper left, a pump turbine motor generator. We have a penstock on the left, which is just the long pipe going down to the bottom of the system. We have a uh, piston, which is the gray area, and then we have a deep short storage shaft, which is the big shaft that the piston resides in, and it's filled with water. As you can see, the blue is water here. Uh, so when we want to store uh, energy, the pump turbine looks like a pump. It's pulling in electricity from the grid, pumping water down the penstock, and hydraulically lifting that very large piston. And when we want to get that energy back, we let the piston drop. It pushes the water around the other direction. 
the, tur the, the pump turbine is now functioning as a turbine driving the motor, which is looking like a generator pushing power into the grid. So you're getting that power back. Now, you see that I've highlighted the word single piston um, in, the, uh, in the slide. I highlight that because it's different than what we were talking about a year and a half ago when I, when I last spoke with on this uh, uh, webinar. And uh, there, there are some uh, reasons we went to the single piston. And we had multiple pistons before. We had a smaller diameter shaft, and it was, much a, it was a much deeper system. So the reasons we shifted to the single piston, and this was after a lot of engineering interface with uh, an outfit, uh, underground engineering experts called Bob and Derrida Engineers, uh, we found that open pit mining versus mine shaft uh, construction allowed us to remove rock at a much lower cost. And then we found that shallower projects re reduce the perceived risk. Rather than going deeper, it made more sense to go with a larger diameter. And it eliminated the multiple piston complexity of adding valves a braking system to hold the stationary pistons in place, and piston-mounted seals going up and down. Because as you can see in this new design, the seal is mounted on the shaft wall and stays in place while the piston goes up and down, uh, pressing against the seal in the middle of that deep storage shaft. So some of the GPM features include that were lower costs than classical pump storage hydro. We've got a slightly higher round trip efficiency because we operate at a constant pressure. Uh, and you can see plentiful materials, flexible siding. That's huge, flexible siding. You don't need a mountain with an upper and lower reservoir to construct this. You just need proper geology and rock. Uh, very little land use. We can put 1,600 megawatts on less than three acres. There's no ongoing water consumption in that it's a sealed system. It does take water to charge. It's essentially quiet and invisible because you can see the power plant is below the surface. And uh, all you see at the surface really is a control room. Permitting should be fast, rapid construction, excellent dynamic response as classical pump storage has. So all of those good characteristics of classical pump storage without some of the negatives. So I mentioned Bob and Derrida engineers earlier. Uh, they are underground specialists, and we iterated with them on a number of different designs to try to come up with the low-cost, low-risk design. And I've highlighted in red some of the things that are new from the, uh, from the last plan, the plan we had a year and a half ago. One is that we've got conventional ex excavation now instead of using a, a specialized vertical shaft uh, reaming machine uh, or, or what is a vertical tunnel boring machine going straight down. Um, so we're just using front end loaders and conveyor belts and conventional equipment now. The piston down below is cut from rock. Uh, so it's Actually, we're taking advantage of the fact that there's a big hunk of mass already there. Um, so let's talk for a second about the construction process. On the right, you've got the big main shaft. This is for a 30 meter, 500 meter deep project, which would be 40 megawatts for, with four hours of storage. And so we go down 250 meters with open, open pit mining construction lining the walls as we go down to make sure that they're secure. And then we use machines uh, called road headers uh, to go down another 250 meters cutting around the circumference of the piston. These road headers are like a, a vehicle with a big uh, a boom on the front with a knob on it that has something that looks like uh, teeth on it that look like uh, the front end of a, of a tunnel boring machine. And so this chips away the rock and puts it, delivers it to a conveyor belt and moves it underneath the machine to the back where that, the cuttings are delivered and moved to the surface. 
Um, so we go down to the bottom, carving out this piston, and then we uh, have a process for constructing the bottom. And uh, when you get all done, you have essentially a big bucket uh, surrounding this rock, which is uh, concrete and uh, uh, rebar anchored into the rock with a stainless steel skin around the circumference of the piston. And on the floor of the uh, piston, you've got uh, rebar concrete with a steel surface, and then on the bottom of the piston, you've got uh, a, a concrete—I mean, a steel bottom—and uh, concrete and rebar anchored up into the rock. So you, you that that gives you a, a piston that is stainless steel covered, which gives you a surface that will interface with the stationary seal at 250 meters down and give you the water seal that you need to make the system work. You can see over on the left, you've got the uh, pump turbine motor generator uh, down a little bit from the surface. Uh, and, uh, you know, as, as it, I, I don't want to take too much time to go through the construction process, but I want to leave you with the feeling that <laughs> we have spent a lot of time developing the details, and there is a report that goes with this. It's many, many uh, pages that step-by-steps uh, walks through the construction process, and associated with that, we've developed uh, this schedule, which details each of the uh, activities required to construct the civil works you just saw on the prior page. Uh, the duration of this construction is 28 months, and so, um, you know, we, we look at uh, uh, 28 months for the Silva work. We're dependent on the delivery of the rotating machinery to complete the project, but we expect that the smaller projects will take about three years and the larger projects will take about five years, which is quick compared to a lot of the alternatives that, that have been in place um, in the past. So if we look at the uh, the powerhouse itself, you can see that that design is, is pretty well conceptualized at this point. You know, the question would come to mind, why is it down in a hole like that? Well, you need some, uh, you need a proper inlet pressure for the pump operation of the pump turbine motor generator. And so that system will be 40 meters down at, at the maximum, or maybe something less than that for the smaller systems. And it's dependent on what the required pressure is for the particular pump turbine motor generator that is selected for the application. But let's say 20 meters to 40 meters down. And, uh, and that will be a, a, the actual dimension will be a function of the final design. So we, we can talk about what the relationship of size is to power out and the diameter of the main shaft and the depth of the main shaft. This curve gives you those relationships and it shows you that, you know, you, uh, bigger systems are better, I think is the answer here. More importantly, we've converted that into a comparison of the cost. Uh, that goes with size. And you can see the different curves for the different depths. Um, there's a legend in the middle showing you the depth of the different uh, main shafts and the curves that go with those depths as a function of uh, size. And the prior slide shows it as a function of diameter, gives you the power out as a function of diameter. So you have all of the pieces to be able to develop cost of projects here at least a, on a rough estimate basis. Now, I think it's important to understand that these numbers were all developed uh, based on German uh, construction uh, costs, and they were performed by underground construction uh, experts, Bob and Derrida engineers. They were actually later given to um, Hawk Tief, the very large EPC firm in Essen, um, Germany who validated and confirmed all of the work that Bob and Derrida engineers did and said that their numbers came in essentially on top of uh, what Bob and Derrida had presented. 
so we, we did have that validation of those cost numbers and schedules and the operation of the system and the construction plan. So we were very pleased to see that. The cost that we show here includes everything including, well, not everything. It doesn't include the grid interconnect. It doesn't include the land purchase. It doesn't include development costs. It doesn't include interest during construction. So one would have to get into the details of just what the scope of supply is here. But it does include a markup that we put on everything for contingency and fees of 25%. So uh, the real costs are 25% less than what we are showing here. Now, one of the things you can look at is if you look at the left side of this chart and you, you imagine where that 40 megawatt four hour unit is, because these are all four hour units shown in this chart, um, you find that the cost of that system is $4,390 a kilowatt, which is pretty expensive. If you go out to the right-hand side of the chart, and you look at a 1,600 megawatt plant, you're looking at $950 a kilowatt, which is very inexpensive. So uh, compared to the alternatives today, that looks very, very attractive. So we have a plan to um, further develop the SEAL system, which is the only component of this whole design which isn't completely demonstrated and proven. So we wanted to uh, go through the process of doing that and we developed our own plan. And that plan consisted of, of uh, using a, a, a lab seal tester two meters in diameter to identify what the best sealing materials would be. And then after that, we were gonna construct a 30 meter diameter actual size GPM seal in uh, a simulated environment and we'd be able to hydraulically actuate a simulated piston that would have the same tolerance imperfections that we would expect in an actual piston and the, the seal itself would be exactly what we would use in a 30 meter diameter system and it would seem see the tame, same um, pressures and speeds and operating conditions that would in an actual system uh, if we were to construct a 500 meter deep hole. So that would give us at least, and, and we believe most of those people interested in such systems confidence that all of the components would then be proven. Now, we have started talking with Merkel, uh, and Merkel has looked at what we had in the way of a development plan for, for sealing, uh, and they're creating their own development plan. Merkel is a world famous uh, seal manufacturer who's an expert in, in such items. Uh, they've constructed uh, 20 meter diameter seals to go with tunnel boring machine applications, so they don't see this as being anything that is a terrific stretch of technology. Um, and uh, uh, they're developing the plan which will be used to develop the SEAL design once we have funding. So uh, we are working closely with them, and so this, this plan that we have in front of you is subject to change. Talking about the uh, the project side uh, of gravity power activity and what's going on there. Germany's uh, the near-term strongest market, but it's being held up by politics and the fact that we have coming elections there in September. And there's a need for new tariffs there in order to make energy storage projects work. Uh, there is no mechanism that allows somebody constructing an energy storage project to get the kind of revenues they need to support the investment. So that's an issue and it needs new tariffs, but those new tariffs won't be developed until after the election. So there's a, a temporary pause, but Germany has, with the huge amount of, of uh, wind and solar development in country and the plans to um, 
Uh, they've actually already retired a number of nuclear projects and plans to retire more. So they have a a real need for energy storage, and, and uh, they have a lot of classical pump storage projects um, that are proposed in Germany. None of them are going to move forward really until after the tariffs change, but there are a number of them that are considering gravity power as an alternative to the classical pump storage design. And some of the potentials we have um, for gravity power installations in Germany are one one is in the Neckar Alb region of uh, Baden-Württemberg, and uh, they, they're actually looking at two different locations, and they have two sites picked out for 300 megawatt GPMs, and they've been identified by the uh, regional Verband. Uh, and uh, uh, there's also a project at uh, Jacques Mountain in Bavaria for 700 megawatt classical pH, uh, classical pump storage hydro. And that project is seen local, as all of these projects are, they're seen local and uh, broad environmental objections to the projects. Um, which is why uh, consideration of the gravity power module is uh, on the table. And because uh, we don't have the impact of needing to create upper and lower reservoirs and, and destroy a lot of the natural beauty of the Bavarian Alps. So there's a Bad, Bad uh, Reichenhall uh, in Bavaria for 450 megawatts. It's also an opportunity and seen um, objections to the proposed classical pump storage project. Uh, Tree and L's looking at a project in uh, Schmalwasser in Thuringia, 1,000 uh, megawatts, and one in Trier in uh, Rhineland, Platz, uh, 400 megawatts. Uh, and uh, NRV Utility Group is uh, looking one in North rhine westphalia 200 to 400 megawatts. And I hope I didn't butcher those German names too badly, but have a tendency to do that. Uh, so anyway, there's a lot of activity and potential projects that we're working on in Germany. And they're all large projects, as you can see. Uh, so that gives us uh, some excitement about being there. The, the U.S. is, is uh, going to take a little longer before they get to the point where I think they do anything on a utility scale, serious uh, energy storage project. Uh, we have been talking with Southern California Edison, uh, who has a need to install 50 megawatts of energy storage, uh, and uh, I think they would it's, uh, they would support a small demonstration for our technology if EPRI would uh, move forward with it. We're, we're trying to reach EPRI, but having a difficult time making that connection to see if they would be interested in doing that. Um, we ranked well in the, in the PG&E RFI that took place here a couple months ago, and we were pleased to see that. But, but PG&E uh, in California does not have a mandate to put in energy storage. They're interested, but they don't have a current mandate, uh, as does Southern California Edison. So, and I think PG&E would be interested in, in participating uh, in a demonstration project with EPRI as would Southern California Edison, but I'm speaking of, I'm saying that without any commitment from PG&E. Um, and there are various other one to five megawatt, when I say small scale, I'm talking about one to five megawatt um, small scale demonstrations that are being considered in the U.S. and in Germany and in India. Uh, so there seems to be a real interest in each of those areas to do something in the way of a a project that proves out the technology, but it may not necessarily be commercially um, a commercially viable project. Similar to Germany, um, the U.S. needs uh, tariffs that support energy storage, which haven't yet been created. So then, South Africa. Uh, as you know, it's an ideal target with its need for capacity in the existing abandoned mine shaft infrastructure, but it's been difficult to get traction there. China continues to hold out potential, uh, but progress is slow. Uh, and, but it does seem to be 
solid in China. So we're we're pleased with the progress we're making. I just wish it was in the next six months. Uh, India uh, is currently having increased uh, interest, and as I mentioned, uh, a small project um, in India is being considered. And Turkey is becoming a strong potential, but it's you know it's dealing with political unrest. So. Uh, there, there was a real surge there of the interest, uh, and I think it probably will continue, but uh, we're hoping that the political unrest there doesn't um, disrupt things to a point that we see significant delays. Speaking about Germany, there's, uh, there, there's a couple of other things that have, have, have happened in Germany. Um, in that neckar alb region, uh, the Government Association of the State of Baden-Württemberg in southern Germany recently released their uh, 2013 draft plan, uh, which included the gravity power module as one of the three alternatives for large-scale energy storage. Well, this is the first time that we have been included in a government plan in Germany or anywhere else in the world as um, equal to classical pump storage hydro. So we're very pleased with that. That plan just came out in April of this year. Um, about a year ago at the University of Stuttgart, uh, Dr. Fall um, made an analysis of the, in, during an energy storage workshop um, where he compared the various alternatives for energy storage and we were pleased that gravity power came out as the most attractive way to store energy in uh, Dr. Fall's study. Um, so, so that was also a, a positive recent event. Milestones, I don't think there's anything too exciting here. Um, we want to get our seal test done. Uh, we want to get a, com a commercial project moving, and uh, those are the goals of the company. We have a strong team got good people in place, dedicated people, uh, and so uh, you can look into the bios uh, which are on our website if you'd like to see that. And so, you know, I, I guess I would, some final comments, we've simplified the design and, and reduced the risk of the projects and reduced the cost. And the market for utility scale energy storage isn't fully developed, but it's close and it's huge. It's a lot of money. Uh, we need to finalize our, our, our uh, seal design and we need to secure a contract for a project and those are our priorities. So we've made significant progress on the IP, the technology, uh, and uh, project development and we're ready to go. So that's, uh, that's what I was hoping to say, and I, and I thank uh, uh, Principal Solar and the Principal Solar Institute and all of you for listening. Uh, I very much appreciate your time. I'd be happy to answer your questions. All right, thank you, Tom. That was very interesting, and um, I have a few questions that I'll start off with. Let me, let me remind the audience, if you have any questions for Tom, or any comments in general, please send those in your chat window in the lower right. Uh, if you have questions for Tom, send that to all panelists. And if you had a uh, general comment for the audience, you can send that to all participants. Um, Tom, my first question was actually on your slide 17. It was the, um, the project from Germany under long-term storage. He had a, um, uh, it was the evaluation from Germany. He had a question mark under long-term storage. Is that because he didn't have that data, or do you have any estimate for what that value should be? I'm uh, um, a question mark under long-term storage. Yes, next uh, to the gravity power module line. <clears throat> so. Oh. I don't, think, I don't think he knew how to evaluate that. I mean, certainly you could get long-term long storage from and, and this is his chart, so I, I, I don't really know, uh, Rick. <laughs> but uh, uh, my assumption is that in or long-term storage is like seasonal changes. 
so you're you're wanting to store in the um, uh, spring and fall, let's say, when usage is low, and deliver it during the summer when it's at the highest, and in the winter when it's next highest, depending on where you are in the world and what your balance of air conditioning to heating load is. So long-term storage is typically um, thought of as, as natural gas in the ground, or there's been some discussion about hydrogen, but it's very expensive storage. I don't see our technology being good for that kind of storage. Our technology is great for managing storage from wind and solar, uh, you know, from day to day uh, and week to week, but not from six months to six months. That's because you get a lot of. You'd have to have an awful lot of of our systems to give you that kind of duration. Okay. Uh, the next question that I had was, I remember back uh, a year and a half ago, you had some talk about bundling eight gravity power modules in a circle as a way of scaling up. I was wondering if uh, you're looking at now, say, uh, a 1,600 megawatt single module is better than four 400 megawatts or two 800 megawatts, or is there some sort of uh, sweet spot as far as how big you need to be before you start to combine multiple modules onto a site? Well, we like, you know, there there are some considerations that, that play off against each other as you get to larger and larger systems. Um, you know, one is that as you go deeper and deeper, the cost of removing rock gets um, more difficult and more expensive. And as you get wider and wider, uh, the cost of removing rock is going down, but you've got the edge of your wall, which is getting flatter and flatter. You know, I mean, if you've got an, an infinite diameter, you've got a flat wall. <laughs> so as the wall gets flatter and flatter, you lose some of the structural strength that you have when you're dealing with a curve. And so you're going to have the trade-off as we get the bigger and bigger holes in the ground for storage, um, bigger main shafts, uh, larger diameter. The trade-off between reinforcing the, the shaft liner wall to make sure it has strong integrity versus the risk of going deeper uh, and the cost of going deeper. So it becomes an economic analysis to figure out what the optimal way is to construct the project. Anything's possible, it's a question of money. So the other issue is that when you're looking at pump turbine motor generators, uh, the sweet spot for manufacturing pump turbine motor generators in, is in the 300 megawatt, maybe 400 megawatt sizes. So you can't get rotating machinery that gets bigger than that. So if, you, if you've got a 1600 megawatt project, uh, you might have one main shaft, but then you might have um, four penstocks, each with 400 megawatt pump turbine motor generators on them. So you would end up with something similar to the configuration that you looked at earlier. That the one thing that you get with the larger diameter systems in a single piston system, as we have it now contemplated, versus the the uh, small diameter shaft, very deep shaft, is that you end up getting a lot more power um, out of a single shaft when it gets bigger diameter. So you don't have to have multiple units. I mean, unless you know, you know, and, and again, it's an economic analysis of how big is is optimal before you get in limitations and, and the structure of the. And part of this is dependent on the geology uh, and and the strength and integrity of the of the rock that you're working in. So there there are a lot of issues to be considered there, uh, but yes, we. Um, we look at having multiple pump turbine motor generators when you get anything over 400 megawatts. I think there have been some constructed that are larger up in the 700 megawatt range, but we would like to use the more prevalent lower cost. It would be nice to standardize and to actually construct 
pump turbine motor generators in a production line way if uh, if we had a program that was moving forward with a fair amount of inertial because that that would bring down the cost of pump turbine motor generators uh, which are all currently designed on a one-off basis and tested and and uh, and so there the cost of construction is is less than optimal it's not like a gas turbine plant where you're pushing out one after another that are all the same design. So I imagine it would end up looking more like the uh, construction of airplanes, um, sort of assembly line. Uh, which right. Would be really nice. Okay. Um, with with a uh, three or uh, say a 400 megawatt uh, gravity power module, how much surface land do you need for construction and during operation? For 400 megawatt? Yes. Um, you know, you don't need much surface land. I mean, if you look at the fact that the uh, 400 megawatt might be a, a 60 or 70 meter diameter hole, um, and I, I don't have that right in front of me, but we could look on the curves, but it's not important. But let's say that's that's not a lot of space. And then if you look at the control building at that to top of that uh, uh, control uh, shaft um, with the pump turbine motor generator at the bottom. You see that all you see at the surface is, a, is that little round control building. But now you're talking about lay down area if you're in the construction process and you're looking at uh, what it takes to move the, the cuttings, the rock out of the hole, which are substantial. And so you're, during the construction period, you're going to need something more. But once it's finished, you probably only need a, a couple acres for a system uh, that's 400 megawatts. Uh, so, you know, the construction process, you're going to need some laydown area that might be another, another five acres, four or five acres. But then once you're finished, you can return that land to its original use and, and uh, you only need a couple acres. So incredibly small compared to a uh, pumped hydro <laughs> lake. Well, it's it's even less than a gas turbine plant. I mean, if you look at 1,600 megawatts on three acres, uh, I mean, a gas turbine plant that's 1,600 megawatts is, I don't know, 20 acres or something like that. So uh, it, it, the, the, the whole... You know what? What you have is a system that's constructed vertically down into the ground, so it just doesn't take any surface. All right, I will go to some of the questions coming from the audience. And again, please chat your questions for Tom. Send to all participants or all panelists in the chat window. Uh, the first one from Doyle: uh, What are the risk of earthquakes? Well, earthquakes are, are an issue for such systems. Um, I have, uh, uh, you know, been in the geothermal business in a grand way in my career, and I've been in oil and gas, uh, and uh, have have done a lot of deep hole, much deeper holes than this. And I might say that they're much bigger and deeper holes than exist in the world than we're contemplating for our systems. But you know, in the geothermal business in California, where you have a number of wells that are going down uh, thousands of feet. Um, I can only think of two wells that were ever impacted by earthquake or uh, fault line shifts. And so, and there you, you have to drill your wells in order to hit specific targets to access the geothermal fluids or in the oil and gas business. you which is not necessarily in tectonically active areas, um, you know, you, you're going after gas or oil. But in our case, we're looking for nothing. And so uh, what we're going to do is a part of the siting process will be uh, drilling uh, core holes, assessing the geology, looking for fault lines, and avoiding those things. We don't see... Uh, we, we don't see an earthquake having any real impact on the system. Um, it's a risk. It could cause cracking in some of the concrete walls. It could cause, I mean, you get a bad enough earthquake, I don't care what you got, it's going to be in trouble. 
any kind of plant's in trouble with a bad earthquake that hits right on top of it. And I don't care if it's a gas plant or it's a nuclear plant in Japan or whatever. You've got an earthquake on top of your plant, you've got a problem. Um, but I don't see this design and plant being any more vulnerable than any of the other power generation technologies. All right, the uh, next question from David. Is it possible to build a system in an area with high water tables, or is this only for rocky inland locations? You know, mines and and have uh, historically gone through aquifers and uh, um, places where you've got water. And the way you do that is you construct down to where you start to hit the water, and you stick probes out into the um, the, the rock in the vicinity of the water in the circumference of the shaft that you're constructing and you inject uh, grout or concrete out into the formation until you build a dam to isolate that aquifer uh, from the hole. And that's the way it's been done in the mining industry for years, so we're going to do it the same way it's been done. Okay, uh, the next question from David was, what is the operating pressure of the system? Uh, we're looking at about 350 meters ahead. Uh, we we actually pick the the height of, you know, the pressure in the system is a, is a constant and it's a function of the height of the piston and the density of the piston. Um, we pick the length or, or the height of the piston knowing the density such that we would get an optimal pressure which is in the sweet spot of the construction and, of, and efficiencies for classical pump storage, hydro pump turbine motor generators, which are Francis-type pump turbines. Um, and that's 350 meters or about 500 pounds per square inch. So it's not extremely high pressure, um, but that's, uh, that, that's what it is. The differential pressure across the uh, piston is about 500 pounds per square inch. All right, uh, a follow-up question to that. So I was trying to visualize, I think you said one of the piston sizes was about 250 meters in height. Right. Uh, so that's like a 75-story building that moves up and down. I was trying to figure out right. if that's a four-hour process. About how fast is that moving up and down? Uh, about, two, about two centimeters a second, so it's going very slowly. Two centimeters per second, okay. Uh, the next question that I had for you was, um, so some of the components of the project seem to be standard technology that's well proven, excavation, things like that, but you've kind of assembled these different components in a, um, in a novel way. What component do you consider to be the farthest stretch from existing and proven technology that um, would be the most concern for um, for, for failure or for adjustments to your design? The, the, and I think I highlighted that in the presentation. The only thing that that uh, uh, people point to that I can't say here's one just like it is the seal system. That seal system needs to be able to create, and we're going to have multiple seals and 100% redundancy in the seal system. So I, I, I'm very confident we can make it work, and the people who are experts in sealing say they're confident we can make it work. And, and as I mentioned, um, there have been 20-meter diameter seals used in the tunnel boring machine that have been constructed by Merkel, who we're working with on that seal design. But it's a little different in that um, you know we're going to have these stationary seals that are mounted on the shaft liner wall at, at 250 meters of depth so that it pushes against that stainless steel skin of the uh, piston as it goes up and down. The piston won't be exactly the same dimension uh, all the way up and down, although we've had really good uh, feedback from the slip form people. It says that the tolerances are about a quarter of what we were using initially, which was 10 meters, uh, 10 centimeters uh, plus or minus 10 centimeters uh, 
uh, tolerance. Um, so now we're down to two and a half as the slip form people say they'll guarantee. But you're going to, ha you know, the the curvature of the outside of that won't be exactly perfect all the time. The centricity of that piston as it goes up and down uh, can move a little bit one way or another, and the uh, uh, it could go in and out a little bit. So that seal holder that and we have created our own design for that, and uh, we'll be patenting that as we go forward. Uh, flexes and moves in and out and changes to be able to continue to maintain the seal as the piston goes up and down with the minor tolerance imperfections of the seal. That needs to be demonstrated and why in our plan we were going to have a full-scale seal test that fully demonstrated that. After we've done that, uh, there's really nothing left uh, in the way of new things to prove or demonstrate. I mean, it would be nice to have a big project and say, there's one, it works. Uh, but, I mean, it, it, the physics of it, it's just not going to change. It's all, it's a big civil project. Um, there's nothing really new here. And the designs, construction plans, schedules, and cost estimates are built by people who will stand up. But Hawk Teeth has said they will build this and provide normal liquidated damages. So uh, as a large EPC firm, you know, like a Bechtel of, of Germany. Uh, so I, uh, I just don't see a lot of risk. Okay, um, what is the expected lifetime of the GPM, and what sort of routine maintenance do you foresee over that lifetime? Well, the lifetime is similar to any classical pump storage project. I mean, the rotating machinery is identical. There's nothing new there. It's operating at the same pressures. There's nothing new there. Uh, so look at 40 to 80 years, 100 years, I don't know, long enough that it the lifetime doesn't become a significant factor in the calculation of your return on investment if you're developing a project. As far as routine maintenance goes, you're going to have rotating machinery. It's going to require maintenance periodically as it does in classical pump storage projects. And you've got this sealing mechanism and those seals, uh, that, that system where the uh, synthetic material presses against the stainless steel of the piston is going to wear over time. And so uh, maybe every 10 years, and, and that's a part of the testing we need to do to show the wear life of these seal materials and determine what's optimal. But we can, we can do that very quickly um, once we have funding to move forward with that operation. And, and have you envisioned uh, that seal replacement process, kind of how that will work? Is that pump all the water out of the uh, system or at least down to the seal level? What what sort of a process does that involve? Well, that, that's exactly the, the current plan, which is our worst case scenario, but we've also looked at uh, uh, being able to remove the seals uh, while the water's in the system. Uh, and, and so that's an option for us, but that plan is not fully developed. And so from a planning and a cost standpoint, we just assume we'll have to remove the water at this point. But I think there's an opportunity there for us to do that um, smarter than we're currently doing it. All right. Uh, another question was this uh, one to five megawatt small scale technology demonstration projects, the, the ones that you were talking about. Uh, how, how much does that cost? How much do you expect you need to get that started? Uh, how long do you think that that demonstration project needs to run before you can say you've proven all the technology? Good questions. Uh, you know, we just had a debate about this for uh, consideration for uh, a five megawatt, eight hour project uh, in India, and we gave a cost estimate that was $4,500 per kilowatt installed for eight hours of storage. Um, But but that's those those are early numbers and we need to we need to figure out just what it'll be. But it seems that the client has interest at that price level. Uh, and of course, power systems in India are different than they are in the states or in Europe. So um, they have different issues and cost parameters to consider as they make their economic analysis there. And and you said what was the price per kilowatt to build that? 
It was five 45. megawatts, eight hours, and 4,500. 4,500. Okay. And then um, th that would be an operating plant, not just a de technology demonstration, or is that the sort of thing no, they would intend, run for a year? Or two? Well, it, it, yeah, it, it would be a demonstration of the technology, but it would a plant. It would be a plant that that would run every day. Would run every day. And and how long do you think you need of uh, collecting data to say that you've proven it, or do you think most of the issues will be worked out during construction, and once it's operated for a few months, it's pretty much proven? I, I think, you know, once you go through your performance tests um, and you've demonstrated the system efficiency and the megawatt output, I don't know that there's a whole lot more to demonstrate. I mean, uh, you got a big piston that goes up and down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, every day. <laughs> All right, well, that's great. Well, we're just about out of time. If there's any last-minute questions, uh, you can post those in the chat window. And um, otherwise, I'll thank uh, Tom. And, oh, wait, here's one last question from Doyle. Uh, would it be possible to do a mini-test with an old Atlas missile silo or, I guess, any other big hole in the ground that's not being used? Yes, it would be possible. I guess, uh, of course, the, the, those silos are not very deep uh, compared to what we're talking about, and it would be a very small project. It could be done. It has limited value to us. It, 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 a project needs to get to be a certain size before the design of the seals that we're contemplating makes sense and the design of the, of the shaft uh, and and uh, uh, the various components are standard. When you're going from our five megawatt to 40 megawatt to uh, uh, 400 megawatt designs or 1600 megawatt designs, you're using exactly the same construction process and plans to do it. The things are going to take longer. You got longer rock more rock to remove and you, and you got more concrete to pour, but it's exactly the same plan. You get as small as a silo, <clears throat> excuse me, and you are looking at, um, you, you're looking at, at building a different kind of piston and uh, uh, a different seal system and, you know, the, the, the parameters become such that, except for demonstrating that you can store energy and release energy using this kind of a system. It doesn't do anything from a technology standpoint that really moves us forward in, in proving out a large design. So if somebody wanted to pay for it, we would do it. But it, 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 to us, it doesn't, it doesn't tell you a lot. All right, and with that, we're out of time. So, Tom, thank you very much for the